Thank you for joining us on Synthesis Workshop. Today is a research spotlight episode, which has been made possible through a partnership with Thema Chemistry, aimed at showcasing some of the work of Thema Chemistry journal awardees. On today's episode, we have with us Dr. Katerina Palish. Katerina earned her PhD at the University of Vienna in the group of Professor Hemmerschmidt. Afterwards, she worked at the University of Vienna Department for Biomedical Imaging and Image Guided Therapy. Currently, she is a senior scientist and independent group leader at the Institute for Organic Chemistry at the University of Vienna. And from there, I'll hand it over to you, Katerina. Thank you for joining us. Hello. It is a great pleasure for me to have been invited as a guest speaker to this podcast series today. And I'd like to thank the hosts for the invitation and possibility to talk about one of my main research areas here, which is the stereoselective synthesis of phosphonates and phosphonic acids, either with or without isotopic labels, and how they can be used as very potent tools to study phosphonate enzymology. Me and my group are both developing general strategies to access whole sets of compounds and developing special methods to access single molecules of interest. But the main purpose of our work is always the same. The compounds that we make are used in mechanistic studies of enzymes involved in phosphonate metabolism. Most synthetic organic chemists know a little or a lot about the synthesis of phosphonates and their applications as drugs. But the knowledge about their biological importance for the environment and about their importance as nutrients for microbes is often missing. So when thinking about the exact things I'd like to say here, I decided to set the focus of this podcast episode rather on why we are making these compounds than on how we are doing so. And to understand why phosphonates are interesting in this regard, I first need to talk a bit about their chemical properties. One of the main features of phosphonates is their potential to effectively mimic the tetrahedral transition state of amide or ester bond formation and cleavage. This feature alone might already make you think that phosphonates are high potential anti-metabolites, and this is of course true, but there is another fact that makes them even more interesting as drug candidates, which is their high stability. And by high stability, I mean that the direct covalent phosphorus to carbon bonds that phosphonates possess can easily resist very harsh pH conditions, high temperatures, and also the action of phosphatases. The combination of their stability and the effectiveness in mimicking different substance classes and transition states is the key driving force for the bioactivity of many phosphonates against microbes. The structures they mimic are ubiquitous in nature and therefore phosphonates with a large variety of different biological activities are known today. The properties range from antibacterial to herbicidal or antiviral, for example. But phosphonates can not only be used to fight pathogens, there is also a very big group of microorganisms that found ways to use phosphonates as alternative phosphorus source. So their relationship to the microbial world was very suitably described as genus based in several reviews already. Nowadays, we know that the use of phosphonates as a phosphorus source is not an ecological niche of lower environmental importance like it was thought for many years. It is a very important part of the global phosphorus cycle, especially in ecosystems that are naturally depleted in phosphate, like most of the oceans, phosphonates play a crucial role. You can see here that compounds called DOPs, so dissolved organic phosphorus compounds, make up very large amounts of the total available phosphorus, especially in the open oceans that are phosphate-poor ecosystems. Phosphate has very low solubility at ambient pressure, pH, and temperature, so microorganisms living in the open oceans evolved strategies to use alternative phosphorus sources like phosphonates in these regions. Metagenomic screenings of whole marine DNA libraries showed about 16% of all marine microbes to encode genes for phosphonate biosynthesis and even 40% of marine microbes to encode genes for phosphonate biodegradation. Despite their importance, phosphonates and their metabolism are 
a very underexplored area of the global phosphorus cycle. And the enzymes involved in these pathways have once been described as a treasure trove of unusual enzymology that still holds many mysteries for us. I personally like to compare phosphonate metabolism to an ancient map covered with many white spots and nobody knows what remains hidden there. There might be bioactive unicorns as well as dragons with dangerous properties influencing whole ecosystems. So we try to color some of these white spots by synthesizing potential intermediates, starting materials or anti-metabolites for pathways that haven't been explored so far. Our collaborators then use them in many different ways, either to study mechanistic details of known enzymatic transformations or to elucidate the structure of newly discovered enzymes, or possibly also to get a first hint at the function of a new enzyme. One example on how chiral phosphonates can be used was the elucidation of the detailed structure and mechanism of the enzyme complex Fen Y star and Fen Z. This couple of enzymes was the first example of an oxidative phosphonic acid cleavage in nature. However, the natural substrate wasn't known, nor was the stereospecificity of the enzyme. So we synthesized a variety of possible substrates and like this, we could really find the natural one. By synthesizing both enantiomers thereof, we could show that the reaction catalyzed by Fen-Y star is selective to produce the R enantiomer of hydroxy AEP. This compound was also used to obtain the first crystal structure of Fen-Z. And of course, we didn't stop there. We also evaluated other substrate analogs and their reactivity towards Fen-Z. Another open problem concerning the biodegradation of phosphonates is the cleavage of phosphomycin. There are microorganisms known that can use this phosphonate as the sole phosphorus and carbon source. And you might now wonder why the exact pathway isn't known, even though we are talking about a compound of such high industrial and medicinal importance but still there are many open questions regarding this degradation pathway. So we synthesized a variety of different possible intermediates of this pathway for feeding studies with microorganisms that can use phosphomycin, as already mentioned, as the sole phosphorus and carbon source. However, there were both problems with the uptake of our first set of compounds, as they are highly polar, and difficulties to prove the existence of certain intermediates. So analogs and anti-metabolites were needed, which we also designed and synthesized, but our hopes that they could be used to solve the remaining puzzles were unfortunately not fulfilled, as our collaborators didn't succeed in reviving the cell culture that was needed for the testings. As already mentioned, synthetic phosphonates can also be used to elucidate the structure of natural products. This was, for example, necessary in the case of phosphonocystoximate and hydroxyphosphonocystoximate, which you can see both in the middle here. Both compounds contain a very heteroatom-rich central core, which made structural proof by an MR spectroscopy very difficult. We could prove that the proposed structures are correct by synthesizing phosphonocystoximate as shown in the green circle and comparing its spectra to those of the natural product. These two compounds don't just have very special structural features though, their biosynthesis is full of open questions too. But the first two steps of the phosphonocystoximate and hydroxyphosphonocystoximate biosynthesis could be elucidated already, and one of the compounds that you already met on the last slide, the one in red shown on top here, proved very helpful again to determine the stereoselectivity of one of the involved enzymes. It was shown that 2-aminoethylphosphonate is the starting material for both cystoximates, it is either directly converted to an oxime by the flavine-dependent amino oxidase PCXL in the biosynthesis of phosphonocystoximate, or it is first hydroxylated by a ferrous iron to oxoglutarate-dependent dioxygenase before HPXL can convert the product to an oxime as well. 
Another related problem was the stereochemistry of hydroxynitrilophos. This tiny little compound that you can see here in violet was isolated from the same strain of microorganisms as the phosphonous histoximates. It was thus believed to be biosynthetically or biodegradatively related to those compounds. This is a question that couldn't be proved so far, but we are working on that problem. What we could show so far is that hydroxynitrilophos is indeed as configured as hydroxyphosphonosystoxime, and thus it could indeed be related to its biosynthesis. We could answer this question by synthesizing both enantiomers of hydroxynitrilophos and comparing their optical rotation to that of the natural product, of which only one milligram was isolated. A key step of our synthetic route towards hydroxynitrilophos was the rhodium-2 catalyzed hydroxylation that you can see in the violet circle. It uses a diazophosphonate that is converted into rhodium carbonoid, which is usually used to insert into the OH bond of alcohols to give the corresponding alkoxy derivatives. But here we used it instead to directly react with water and produce an alpha hydroxyphosphonate. The disadvantage of this reaction is that it produces the shown alcohol only as a racemic mixture that had to be resolved in order to obtain both enantiomers separately. The last example that I'd like to show you is a more recent one, where some of the compounds that we made were used to elucidate the first steps of the biosynthesis of a very unique compound named phosphonochlorine. We could prove that a very uncommon epoxide is an intermediate of phosphonochlorine biosynthesis and its formation is catalyzed by the iron-2 and 2-oxoglutarate dependent oxacyclase FFND. Also, we could show that the oxygen present in this epoxide is the same as in the starting material 2-hydroxyethylphosphonic acid by preparing O18 labeled substrate analogs. By using deuterated substrate analogs, on the other hand, we could show which proton is abstracted during epoxide formation. This, of course, already gave us a hint towards the stereochemistry of this epoxide, but additional proof for this stereochemistry came from reacting it with ammonia. This yields 2-amino-1-hydroxyethylphosphonic acid, which is a natural product of known configuration and of which the optical rotation of each enantiomer is literature known. Only one of these enantiomers, namely the R1, reacts with the HD domain mixed valence diiron deoxygenase gm -Z. As the compound formed after epoxide opening with ammonia did not react with gm -Z, this was the final proof for the epoxide starting material to be as configured. And there are many open questions concerning the biosynthesis routes of compounds like hydroxynitrilophos or K26, phosphenotrixine or valinophos, just to name a few. And of course, the biodegradation routes aren't completely studied either, and there might as well be other ones that we don't even know about. The enzymology involved in phosphonate metabolism still holds many mysteries and many known transformations are still black boxes where we only know what starting material is that we pop in on top and what the product is that comes out on bottom, but we have no clue on how the products are formed. Other transformations seem as complex as if they involved some kind of magic and Extraordinary enzymes involved in phosphonate breakdown are identified at a very rapid pace today, thanks to genomic screenings. So there is still a lot to do in this field for us and our collaborators. And for those of you who might ask who this us is, I'd like to show a few pictures of the people who are doing this work together with me, together with some of our collaborators. Those are my co-workers, Tamara Dinhoff, Lukas Scheiberberger, Dora Stankovic and Kaya Lippert, as well as our former colleagues Christoph Braunsteiner and Thomas Kalina. And in the bottom line, you can see some of the collaborators doing the fascinating enzymology work that I've been talking to you about today, like David Zetchel from Queen's University in Ontario, or John McGrath and Jason Quinn from Queen's University in Belfast, Alessio Peracchi from the University of Parma, and Martin Pollinger from Penn State University. 
Thank you very much for listening. I hope that I could spark your interest in this fascinating topic a little during my talk. Thank you for watching this Research Spotlight episode, and thank you to Katerina for taking us into the world of phosphonate metabolism and enzymology. Thank you as well to Tima Chemistry for making this episode possible. If you enjoyed the episode, you can support us by subscribing and telling your peers about this podcast, and feel free to send us any questions or comments you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date, and see you all next time.